Welcome to the HPC Best Practices uh, webinar series. The series is brought to you by the Ideas Productivity Project, which is part of ECP, the Exascale Computing Project of the United States Department of Energy. I'm Osni Marquez from Morris Berkeley Lab. I'll be the host for today's webinar, Our Road to Exascale, Particle Accelerator and Laser Plasma Modeling. The webinar will be presented by Axel Hubble. Uh, we will offer a set of webinars showcasing the changes and challenges that projects went through since, since the beginning of the ECP, and Axel will be the first speaker in that set. Uh, Axel is a computational physicist at Berkeley Lab. He is researching advanced particle accelerators and with computational modeling tools, developing BLAST, which is the Beam Plasma Accelerator Simulation Toolkit, and also working in the DOE ECP application Warp X. Before joining Berkeley Lab in 2019, he was part of a team of undergraduates who, uh, that made uh, in the uh, ACM Gordon Bell finals in uh, the SEC 13 conference with the first particle in cell code running on the Titan GPU cluster in Oak Ridge, right? Uh, so uh, he was uh, also the more recently the co first author of the paper that was awarded the 2022 last year. Uh, ACM Gordon Bill Prize at the SEC uh, conference. Uh, we have issued uh, about 150 tickets for today's webinar. Let's see how many of them uh, people will show up. Uh, all attendees have been muted upon entry, just did it. <laughs> well, we'll be receiving questions through the Zoom chat and also the Google Doc. I'll uh, put those addresses, I'll put that address in the, uh, in the chat momentarily. Uh, we have asked Axel to add breaks during this presentation so he can respond to the questions that come in. Uh, and uh, with that, Axel, please, please take over here and stop my sharing. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and for the invitation to, to show our work here at the webinar series. I'll put up my slides. Here we go. Yeah, and thank you everyone for, for joining us today. Uh, see a, a lot of familiar names. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I will speak about our journey that we had on the road to Exascale during the last uh, years in the Exascale Computing Project. And in particular, I will speak as a representative of the WarpX project led by Jean-Luc Vey at LPNL and collaborators, um, which I will talk to you in more detail in just a few slides. So our goal is to invent new party accelerators. And we do for that a, a, a research in a field that's called laser plasma modeling. So, let me give you an overview and then we, we go and dive deep, deep into the domain science um, and then you will see how we address our challenges with computing. The talk will be uh, grouped in these sections here as shown in the outline. Uh, we'll do a quick introduction on our domain science. Um, then we will look into the HPC aspects um, in the past and the journey that we had. I will uh, seep in um, through the whole talk lessons learned um, that we experienced in our transition from um, our legacy code warp to warp X um, and an adoption of exascale. And I will make breaks at each of these sections for short questions and then we have a longer Q&A at the end. And um, since I'm presenting on Zoom, I will not necessarily see all raised hands. And um, so I'm relying a little bit on Osni to, to tell me if we have raised hands um, in the intermediate parts uh, after each section. So please feel free to use the raise hand feature or chat um, to get your intermediate questions out. All right, then let me introduce you a little bit what we are doing. So I'm working in the field of party accelerators and party accelerators themselves are an essential tool in modern life. You might be familiar with the most exotic part on the right here and the most prominent part, which is discovery science, like the big machines uh, for light sources, like the LHC at CERN, which are as of today responsible for roughly one third of the Nobel prizes awarded in physics. The way bigger usage of particle accelerators is in the fields that I showed to the left of this. So there are thousands of accelerators in medicine from imaging to treatment. There are tens of thousands of, uh, of applications of particle accelerators in industry, starting from things like a sterilization of food up to semiconductor processing um, and production. And there are applications such as in national security, such as scanning um, and stockpile stewardship. All of these fields have a great opportunity to have an even bigger impact in life, and that's by reducing the size and cost of the particle accelerators that we use today. So in particular, if you think of the large-scale machines that we use for discovery science and physics, 
they are currently limited by the size, by the energy that we need to build them and the energy that we need to operate them. And if we can shrink them, part accelerators down and make them more powerful, then we can um, scale them actually up in the constraints that we have today. Now, as a person that is working in modeling, our task is to assist all the way from the exploration of new party accelerator schemes um, to understanding um, how they work up to the design and potentially support and operations um, with modeling of these complex devices. What does make the field of modeling party accelerators complex? So party accelerator physics is a field where you have a lot of relativistic physics, so particles that go close to the speed of light uh, going on. And for that, we model usually with a with a field or with a with a with an approach that we call particle and cell. We use three kinds of discretizations in here. So the main parts are we have relativistic particles, they are Lagrangian markers that move throughout our domain. We have electromagnetic fields, so EMD fields, magnetic fields, electric fields that we uh, approximate as grids. And we have often also structures such as beam pipes from particle accelerator or anything that metal or dielectrics that is in this domain um, as a complex um, boundary condition and can be arbitrarily shaped. So these are the discretizations we have to deal with. The challenge is that we need a lot of resolution for contemporary particle accelerators to model them right. So instead of real particles, we currently model representative particles that can represent somewhere from one real to maybe millions of particles per model particle. Our fields we discretize on a grid and grids have resolution that we have to control. We have structures that interact with both of them. And the really challenging part is here that we have to go over many time scales and, and space scales. So quite often, for example, if we model a new particle accelerator like a plasma structure shown on the bottom left, what we need to do there is to model micrometers and below in plasma structures. Um, but then we have like accelerating structures that are meters to kilometers in size. The time scales associated with that can be nanoseconds and shorter uh, for a beam passing one accelerator element up to seconds and more when they run out of their lifetime and are replenished in an accelerator. So what we need for that is, is really good algorithms and really large computers to address this. And what our group has done to address this besides making our algorithms faster is we also pioneer new algorithms to cut down on the number of measures, such as measure Feynman, I'll show you a little bit later on that, and number of time steps that we need to model um, these physics. Now, recently our field, um, so all party accelerators in the US and internationally came together to do a planning activity for the current and upcoming party accelerators that we wanna be able to build internationally. So examples for that is the high luminosity upgrade at the LHC, the PIP2 accelerator, um, a Fermilab, but also like accelerators like here at Berkeley Lab that you can see uh, with the LS, which is a light source, or future accelerators that are driven by laser pulses such as the Bella experiment at Berkeley Lab. And the, so the challenges that we identified in the so-called snow mass process where we, where we developed a, a roadmap for the next uh, years ahead is that in order to reach these high energy physics accelerator grand challenges, we have to address a couple of points such as creating more intense beams, better quality of the particle beams that we create, we create we need to get better control and better predictive capabilities for that. And what we what we derive from that as models are the react parts in between. We need to model even more particles in our beams and accelerators. We have to have more precision. We have to have more physics effects. We need to simulate all the particles, not just representative ones. And in the end, we have to really model start to end. So what you want to take away from this is if we want to build the next generation of particle accelerator tools, accelerator tools, we also need the next generation of HPC modeling tools to be able to address these challenges. Now, there will not be the way that we can just write one code and it will cover it all. Basically, we have a couple of challenges to address when we go from exploration over design and operation to party accelerators. And they can be roughly quantified in this uh, space here of two contrary um, challenges that we have to address from being able to model very fast. That is great when you wanna do an optimization of an existing machine, when you wanna find a great working point, or you want to be extremely accurate on the other side, where you want to go for the full physics modeling of a new acceleration concept. Um, so what we want to implement is basically this, these uh, algorithms in a way that we can, as a user, really turn knobs. So you can imagine going left to right with these knobs by se uh, selecting different algorithms for modeling, by going either from full physics modeling for a new case that you have never seen before, 
or to reduce the physics because you say, okay, I'm operating this regime. I can turn off a couple of effects and save computing time. You can do the same kind of back and forth for algorithmic switches and implementation switches between geometry, for example, full geometry to reduce geometry, high to low resolution, or also first principle modeling to surrogate modeling and effective models. So what we try to deliver is basically tools that allow us to switch algorithms on the scale back and forth. And at Berkeley Lab, the, uh, the toolkit that we developed for this and the mean towards the goal is to have an open source software system that we call the Beam Plasma and Accelerator Simulation Toolkit that develops both codes that have each of these parts well addressed and they are compatible working together. Now, let me give you a little bit, oh, any, any question at this point on the physics, um, quick introduction. Oh, I don't see any. All right, perfect. But let me jump into the then, um, what happened before we started with Exascale and what did we develop before that? So the history of our development modeling started um, here uh, actually in 1989 and started with uh, Alex Friedman here in Harbor developing a modular Fortran code at the time that was modeled to uh, was used to model beam transport with so-called electrostatic pick. So what we do there is we solve a Poisson equation and we push particles in a beam pipe. This is very, very general and very useful. It was actually before MPI times, so there was like PVM used for implementation, but it was already developed in a way that it's modular. So what you could do at this time is you write foreground modules that are accelerated and you glue them together with Python. There were core developers that are still part of OpEx, such as Dave Grothy joining at the time, more contributors in 95. And um, this grew more and more to a really nice uh, modeling toolkit uh, at the time, mostly also for um, uh, ion driven fusion concepts. Then in 1993, the NLPI of Warp X joined the project. And what he had developed at the time was an electromagnetic part in the cell code, which I will show you the loop in a bit, which was then integrated with Warp X um, and then for, uh, with Warp and then continued forward, having these two algorithms for this algorithmic versatility that I showed you before. Now in 2000, then the code got a major revamp and it started to really embrace MPI with standardization and modularization by having these Fortran and Python modules that I mentioned. And then going forward was open sourced and with that attracted a lot of contributors, which is also still the success that we use today to have an open development model since then actively embraced. And with that, we contribute, got contributors not only from DOE labs, but also um, international contributors that you will see have shaped um, quite a bit of development. What was then also continued to develop at NESAP, uh, for, uh, adopting for machines, and then with 2016 was adopted to the ECP project and became an application in that. Now, what was the, were the applications of WAP at the time? So WAP um, did this electrostatic and electromagnetic modeling. So you could have things like linear accelerators and beam dynamics modeled. Um, so anything that's relativistic particles, interaction with walls and so on. But one really important place for us is so-called plasma acceleration that we'll show you a couple of animations from in a bit, where we shrink the acceleration lengths from usually meters that you see in the upper use cases to here centimeters, millimeters, and actually acceleration lengths of tens of microns compared to the big like one yard, half a yard size accelerator cavities that you see in the top pictures. Another thing that was important to WAPX besides uh, WAP at the time, besides the software development, is the innovation in algorithms. So quite early, we started to investigate things like mesh refinement for the fields so that we can focus resolution on the parts where it matters for our algorithm. This is relatively easy for electrostatic solutions by a solve a Poisson equation, but it's re really challenging for electromagnetic pick. And that's one of the active research topics where we have great intermediate results that we showed at Gordon Bell for really physically relevant use cases. And there are more and more innovative algorithms that we developed um, to address um, stability of, of codes and also precision of the predictions that we do when we calculate at scale. Now, what were the limitations in 2016 and why did we decide to write a new code? So the code was already written in this modular port Fortran plus Python, um, but the challenges that came in here is really the, the typical things that you have from this, from this approach. You had to learn multiple languages, and it was already challenging to scale in supercomputers, and it was really hard to transition to new hardware. And specifically, many core at the time came up in GPUs. We had a relatively small team, and also funding-wise, it's usually that the development is usually second, right? It's always a mean. Um, and it's usually not even directly funded. There was some funding, for example, DOE SciTech, 
support the development uh, specifically and, and also collaboration with computer scientists. Um, but it was usually distributed over many uh, contributors and quite diluted, so we couldn't push really on a modern software update. Now, with the Exascale Computing Project from, from DOE coming up, we had the, provided the opportunity to focus an effort. We specifically focused on laser-driven accelerators and had a sufficient critical mass and more to address a couple of really big challenges that I'll show you next. Now, any question on the, on the past? If not, then I'll go straight to the future. <laughs> Perfect. You can go straight to the future. Perfect. So our journey from Warp to WarpX. Let me give you a little bit of a historic overview here of a nice list um, compiled by Carl Rupp, uh, Carl Rupp the contributors uh, from, from, from the community. It gives us a little bit of a trend of microprocessor data. So it, it's pretty interesting because it's the same time scale that you saw in Warp to, to now WarpX. If we look at the frequency of microprocessors that we have historically here over the last 50 years, there's a trend that in the mid 2000s, as we, as you might, as are probably aware, the frequencies could not be increased any more further. And it means just buying a new processor would just not give you a higher clock rate and with that a new positioning power. What is the problem and what, why does this happen? The reason for that is, is we could not just pump in more and more power um, into individual chips. So there's no chip right now where you can just pump in a couple of kilo, kilowatts of energy um, simply because yeah, connections is a problem and also cooling of that. As a result for that, the single thread performance that we get for CPUs, for example, but for any kind of computing chips also started to tank. We see that there's a specific dip here in the 2010s that we could mitigate still with things like uh, in increased pipelining, increased vectorization on architectures, but all in all, we just don't get the same exponential growth anymore that we had here on this nice log scale. So what did industry do as a workaround for this is in the mid 2000s, is it started to develop more and more logical cores. So getting into parallelism on individual chips. And so we started with things like many cores um, developing from CPUs to KNL. And then you have like power architectures and then specifically on the high range of cores per cards, we have GPUs now with three generations early with NVIDIA, AMD and Intel that address this problem of, of tackling and, and taking performance by going more and more parallel. So what does this mean for us as a modeler? For us, it means we need to distribute our simulation over more and more logical and the physical computing units. So for a typical cluster, this, or for like a, a high-end cluster these days, it looks like this. We take our simulation domain here shown on the left-hand side, and we cut it into pieces. We do a, a domain decomposition. This domain decomposition happens in multiple levels. First, we cut it on tens of thousands of computers of a supercomputer. And all, what you show here in the gray part is communication regions between neighboring domains. I will come back to this later. Then each of these domains on these computers then has to be contributed again over depending on sometimes tens and dozens of CPU cores, sometimes tens of thousands of logical cores, depending if you talk CPUs or GPUs. But all in all, for a supercomputer, we talk about millions of cores that we have to program on the second level in total. And there are two prominent examples here, CPUs that I mentioned before, where you want to do some subtitling again, and GPUs where you usually describe things in a large block parallel manner of vectorization. Now, a potential future could go even further, and so we have to address this somehow in our designs. It's that there might there are already applications, for example, in molecular dynamics that directly go into an integrated ASICs, so building their own chips. FPGAs might be an intermediate way to program them, but there are also newer uh, things that are arising like quantum circuits. And so what we need to think about is how can we potentially abstract these, lex these last layers to be portable in the future without having to rewrite our code fundamentally every time. So how do we address this? We teamed up in the Exoscale Computing Project with the AMRA X, li AMRA X library. AMREX is providing us with this domain decomposition. Um, and it provides us with a couple of tricks here. For example, we just don't, don't just compose, but we over decompose our problem into multiple tiles per MPI range so that we can do load balancing later on and move around tiles that have a lot of particles and blocks of them um, to GPUs or to other MPI ranks that have less particles. We use a performance portability layer to write our algorithms. I'll show you an example in a second. And that way, it's at compile time, we can just switch if we go to a different GPU or CPU architecture and can with that um, write our physics once and don't have to port it. We just generalize it once to this performance portability layer. 
the logic that we use for that might be familiar to you if you ever have looked into things like um, Cocos, Alpaca, Raja. Um, AMRX has a similar performance portability layer based on parallel four constructs and then scans and reduces and, and also partial scans and reduces that you need to express your algorithms. And we write this in modern C++. And do you see here, this is like this parallel force compiled with compile time. And this Lambda here is what is usually computed per thread or like virtual thread, depending on the architecture that you're on, on the device. With that implementation, we can do comparisons such as comparing the power CPU on Summit with the V100 GPU on Summit. We see that we get the expected increase in performance, which should be roughly a factor of 10 to 20, depending on your, your CPU to GPU ratio. Um, and then we can do scaling tests and we see, yeah, we get both relative and absolute performance as expected from this portability layer. On top of that, AMRX um, is a co-design center at ECP um, as a library it, uh, that, that helps us to implement our algorithms and we uh, contribute back to them. And as a library, it implements more than this performance portability in domain decomposition. So for example, we can use linear solvers. Um, we can use the embedded boundary concept um, and then we implemented things like having parsers for user-provided math expressions, which is super imp uh, important for us as physics modelers at the end, because you don't want to recompile your code every time you use it, but we can express things like a complex math function and evaluate it as an input for our simulations um, by evaluating functions on the GPU. So neat tricks like these we were, were shared back and forth between MREX as we found them in WarpX to be useful. Now the warp X code itself is, as I mentioned before, a particle and cell code, and here are the details. We implement the electrostatic and electromagnetic fully kinetic particle and cell code. The electromagnetic loop is shown here, which is an explicit forward iterating time loop. And you can start here at any point um, in the loop. So let's start at the beginning. We pick up our particles that have an initial velocity, and we push them forward in space. As particles move, they are charged in our case. We have electrons and ions they will deposit a current. This current we move back from the particle domain to the field domain. These deposited currents then are included in Maxwell's equations to create B fields. So everyone knows this, if you have a wire through that one is going a current, you will create a B field around it. This B field is folded in our fields and, uh, and, and manipulated then uh, and, and moved together with the electromagnetic field update, which is things like an antenna moving electromagnetic waves through the simulation domain and everything that's similar to that uh, in concept. As the last step in the loop, we then gather the fields on the particles, use Lorentz force to update the particle momentum, and then push the particles again. This is the basic electromagnetic um, relativistic particle cell loop. What we implement on top of it are advanced algorithms that I pitched a little bit earlier. So for example, we can switch into Lorentz boosted frames of reference that are more ideal for computation efficiency. They can use instead of FDTD solvers that are very common for field solves, spectral solvers and that are more stable um, and more long-term uh, qualitatively uh, yeah, favorable for our simulations. And we have more and more things implemented here like loading pad geometries. This all is Maxwell's equation. So this is the full solution of electrodynamics but it means it's only that as well. That means if we want to add any physics processes that are not electrodynamics, but they are, for example, quantum processes, we have to add them on top of that, usually with Monte Carlo modules. So what we do is field ionization, for example, is a quantum process. And Coulomb collisions is a very short-term process that we want to model quantum electrodynamics, so the creation of particles in very high fields. Um, these things we add on top of that in the party and cell loop. And usually we do this after gathering fields, we create new particles from them or modify particles based on these quantum processes. In the implementation now, I showed you before, we want to have these knobs and switches from fast to accurate. We implement different geometries from 1D to 3D. And we also implement a quasi cylindrical geometry, which is quite often useful for particle beams that are close to um, an axis and moving forward. Now on the HPC side, we do multi-node parallelization. MPI is still the uh, communication layer. We do a 3D domain decomposition with over decomposition for load balancing. We have on the node parallelization that we can compile to a GPU for CUDA, for NVIDIA, HIP for AMD, and Circle for Intel GPUs. And on the CPU, we just do a block structure parallelization with OpenMP threads and then vectorize within these individual threads. We have wrapped this all together then to be scientifically productive, to have scalable and standardized I.O. 
So we use a standardized Python interface that we develop and it's called particle and cell modeling interface. And we use a schema that I develop. It's called open particle mesh data uh, schema, which is an abstraction on top of HDF5 or Arios so that we can use multiple IO backends um, to uh, yeah, standardize type of schema that we can read um, depending on the machine and the workflow that we want to use. And on top of that, we add in situ diagnostics. So instead of just creating a lot of data for every simulation run, we analyze data and create histograms or projections of our particle beams on the fly. Now I showed you already a couple of, of people, and this is the team that we now see at, at ECP. Um, we have a collaboration here started at Berkeley Lab, which is the lead um, in collaboration with the Computational Research Division for AMRX. We have co-developers from Warp, like Dave Grody contributing and contributors from Slack. But what's really interesting is, is that the way that we push this out in the open and develop everything on GitHub and in open workflows, we still have this large list of international contributors that chimed into ECP and contributed their science cases for, for our code base that we can then, of course, reuse as well for our case. Um, and on top of that, since recently, we also have adoption in the private sector, such as fusion startup companies that took our code and made it useful for the implementation simply because electromagnetics and electrodynamics that we are modeling here is extremely general and it can be applicable way more than the particle accelerators that we're targeting here at ECP. Now, how do we transition now from WAP to WAPX? Let me show you the, the transition. So I mentioned on the previous slide, we had WAP with this electrostatic magnetic pick code implementation. And uh, the way how we, uh, how we move forward when we targeted ECP was at a time uh, GPUs were not yet clear that they would make the running right for extra scale. So what was targeted at the time and when 2016 ECP started was uh, many core architectures such as KNL. And what the first step that we did is we abstracted the electromagnetic pick card and pick part into its own library that we could accelerate. Um, later on, this library then there were further for having in things like high field physics effect included that I mentioned before. Now, in with ECP, then we coupled to the AMR library AMRX so that we could solve the problems that I mentioned before and having proper um, domain decomposition and so on um, available. WARPX itself then was evolved further um, by, by taking these individual components and then building the application on top of that. We had already experience with GPUs um, before starting in ECP purely in the Python world where we prototyped the PIC code that was using pure Python and number to port to a GPUs for NVIDIA GPUs in particular. So what we were interested in is, can we use some of this experience and couple this here together? Now, in the middle of the project, and this was roughly 2019, we had a problem that we could not go further with the initial approach of having this Fortran code um, and going, going to GPUs. We were running basically out of compilers. We used a directive-based approach initially um, to, to parallelize to, to KNL and then GPU. And what we decided then is to use the new C++ performance portability layer from MREX and pour the leftover part of this library to full C++. And with that, we could address not only the CPUs and the KNLs before, but we got support for GPUs, for three kinds of GPUs at the same time. So this was in 19 when we had to redesign our physics routines. And it turned out with the performance portability layer of the parallel force that we had in MREX, this was actually extremely smooth. So we ported probably 60% of our kernels in a one week hackathon and then had enough blueprints to transition the rest over the regular development cycles. So that was really good experience. And the, the thing that I want to take away here is like hackathons are the right place to start your experiments and do a real good push. You don't need to finish there, but you want to start in a, in a team focused way like a hackathon. Now, over the time then, and that was exactly 29 what I described, we had more and more people joining. So we had this NASA project going on and had postdocs contributing. We had more postdocs from AMCRD and MREX and on our side. And it was in 2019 as well that I joined from an earlier project that I did during my PhD and before moving to DS, which was the Pick on GPU project, where we had already a CPU a GPU version of a party on cell code implemented in C++. And I then joined as a postdoc and since then has become a member of staff uh, at Berkeley Lab. Now I want to show you a little bit, this is development, but what makes it actually productive and what makes it scalable with the number of people that you saw and them also contributing sporadically on their need, right? It's not like everyone goes to work in the morning and says like, okay, today I want to develop Warp X, uh, specifically not the contributors. For them, it's more driven 
by I have this need, I want to change this part, I want to contribute this part to, uh, to warp X, but otherwise they have their own problems. So what we do is we realize that we have to scale the sustainable development of our documentation and knowledge in the team so that we can share it and maintain it over time. One thing that we adopted from the Python world, even though we are a core C++ project, is documentation to be created on the moment we implement features. Before developing um, uh, codes, we usually had a problem that we had like a separate manual or we documented our logic in a wiki page and you never knew when to update it. Like you have a development version of your codes, you have a release version that you use for your science, and then you do releases over time, like once a month, for example. When do we update your wiki page? During development, then someone that's using the stable version will be updated. Later on, like when you want to release, then you're usually busy with something else. So this didn't work for us anymore. And what we do is we just uh, do the documentation as part of our development circle a cycle in the uh, pull request that changed the code. And then we build the documentation automatically up from each of the branches that contains also the logic. Testing is uh, a problem that is, uh, that, is, that is probably well known by now. Continuous integration is extremely important for us. We realized from testing initially after merge on the hardware that we targeted, that tests have to be done before we update the code base so we don't influence each other. So basically on GitHub terms, um, on pull request basis, every test has to pass before we merge it in. We had a couple of interesting experiences here. So for example, we replaced server files um, for checks, uh, with checksums for our data, but we also realized that updating dependencies like AMRX for, AMRX for us should be done in a pull request themselves and not only pull in the development version because then you don't have control over your tests. So these are a couple of lessons that we learned here. At the same time, we also improved processes, uh, specifically with the ideas ECP project in the PSIP process, productivity, sustainability, improvement planning. This is a great homepage I can recommend and that we did to push up our metrics and see where we have gaps actually. And what we saw is, for example, that we didn't have an onboarding process in these uh, technical aspects. Um, and so we established that and pushed up these parts. We improved also uh, continuous integration like this one. Um, and yeah, this helped us a lot to just see what is the checklist of things that I can improve for our workflows. We then wrap up our productivity by, by shipping our code to developers and users. And so what we address here is we don't just go for one package manager, but for a whole suite of them. So the most common way for scientific software these days is you download the software, you compile it yourself, and then you use it. That is challenging both for new developers, but also for users to quickly get into. Our strategy is to attract new developers by first attracting new users that find the code useful, and then they decide to change it because they like it a lot. So what we do is we provide package managers like Conda that are known from the Python world that just install your ready to go version of the latest WebX stable release on your desktop. If you can install it on your desktop, you can run in low resolution, then you can change it on your low resolution, and then you actually release, realize at some point, I want to be an HPC user. And that's where I then go for package managers um, and either loading WebX directly or going for spec. And spec is a package manager that can be also used on desktops, but is also very popular on HPC machines in the US um, and can provide modules directly and helps us to communicate what are the dependencies of WebX two facilities and they then pick over in this common language that we define in packages to install more Excel machines. That is extremely helpful for us. Now, all of these are software projects themselves, so they are moving um, themselves. That means for us, we want to test them. We want to test the things that we document that are actually working. And so what we do every night, we have a continuous integration runner that just runs the documented installation logic and sees that nothing either on our project or on the projects that you are package managers themselves broke. And so we can follow on different operating systems that they install the documented package managers work and that a user that has a first time contact with Rx and just wants to try it out has a good experience. Now, any questions to this point? Um, okay, first, let's see here. With such an open developer model <clears throat> and so many users, how do you handle questions and support and what is the time and the staffing that, that you know takes for, for that effort? Yeah, so that's a great question. The way how we approach this is to advertise as much as possible open development channels. So we use extensively GitHub issues 
um, that both us, but also our developers and contributors can, can contribute to and use to. We have an open Gitter channel for everyone that just wants to try it out. Um, and on top of that, only at the end, we have a Slack internal uh, communication that is more to closer collaborators, but it's also quite liberal in who we add to our Slack. So the way of uh, the, the way of uh, to approach this is to uh, as broadly as possible distribute the uh, the support work into open channels and avoid getting emails and avoid getting direct messages. That does not scale. Um, another thing that we do is we have a developer meeting once a week. I could have described this also as a sprint. Um, and the uh, people that we invite there, uh, or people, everyone that wants to develop can join there. Um, and that's where we generally update each other and coordinate what's happening in development. There is an implicit understanding that if you contribute a feature, you are available as well if we have follow-up questions to that. Um, and that usually works pretty well. I think that that's, yeah, we never have had a problem with that, that someone said like, no, I want to contribute this and never speak about it again. Um, but of course, contributors as well rely on us that they say like, okay, WarpX is long-term funded with ECP in this case. And the things that we contribute will actually be part of the next release. When we update WarpX with ECP for our goals, what they contributed will also still be working. So this is basically the social contract that we have. So another question here, how did you improve onboarding? The, uh, the onboarding, how we improved this is, um, we, with PCP we developed a workflow or we looked at the workflows that it provided um, to, um, to generally challenge, yeah, address these changes in a systematic manner. So what we did is we, we uh, realized what are the different work, so actually we did it, well, let's make it simple. It's a to-do list, but a sophisticated one. <laughs> it's a sophisticated to-do list. We have individual parts on it, like are you a user of WebEx, are you a developer? Um, and then we have the individual parts and they are like, we have to sign up you for lists. We wanna make sure you're on the right channels. Uh, you wanna make sure you have access to HPC machines. So we developed a sophisticated to-do list um, that we then share actually with the onboardee themselves. And then we together just with the person that onboards them is going with them to the, through the to-do list. And with that, we can basically abstract the problem away that you don't need a specific person to onboard someone. Anyone in the team can now onboard anyone because they have this list to and their references to go through. So we have two more questions here, include the one that came in, in the chat, but let's just you know delay to the end. To, so for the sake of the time, please That's continue. Okay. Yeah. So let's go on to where we are now. And then we follow up in the Q&A at the end. So WarpX and its ecosystem. In, in the XSK computing project, our goal was to focus on one specific kind of particle accelerator, and that's this laser-driven plasma acceleration. So in ECP, as you're aware, what we try to uh, what we try to achieve is have software ready to, the, uh, to run on the first XSK computing system. That was recently achieved with Frontier, as you might know, as you, as you probably know. And so an exaflop is 10 to the 18 calculations per second. Um, of course, that's measured usually in benchmarks like matrix multiplications. So our algorithms then have a fraction of that, um, but we want to be characteristically efficient on these machines as it's to be expected for the flop to byte ratio of our algorithms. On the physics part, what we do is we model a part accelerator that is driven by a really intense laser pulse and that is driving a wake, and I showed this in an animation here, that creates an accelerating field for a particle beam that you see here in green and that gets more and more energy in yellow. So what we do here is we basically transform laser energy into a, into a plasma wave that creates an accelerating field. And then we transform this field into an accelerated beam. This laser pulse at some point of the stage will deplete. And this is uh, here the first part. Then we mirror this out and feed in a new laser pulse for the next stage. Our goal is to stage a particle beam from one to the next to the next plasma stage so that we can increase more and more energy in a particle beam by transferring laser energy into this particle energy. This is how this looks in an animation. So this is the first stage. The laser pulse is just seen as the effect here for the focusing field. And the particle beam is going from left to right more and more forward through these stages and gains more and more energy. This video here is from 2020. Um, as you can see, we get more and more energy of the particle beam but we do not, did not yet at the time have control over keeping the particle beam nice and narrow. And that's what we researched over the next, uh, the current years is that we actually have now this particle beam also on our control to stay nice and narrow and gain energy at the same time. All right, so this is the science case. And then at the same time, we had to go from these different machines. We started with CPU architectures, 
two GPU architects, so to, to many core in early in ECP. Then we had like GPU architectures like ProModder uh, and Summit. And then now we just reached the exascale barrier by having this AMD GPU machine with Frontier on the floor, which we ran on last summer. And there will be one more machine coming up um, very soon, which is the Aurora machine, uh, which is with Intel um, GPUs that we are targeting. So that's our science case. We try to accelerate particles in short plasma stages of multiple centimeters instead of multiple kilometers to reach really high energies in a compact envelope. Now we used the WAPX code then last, last summer and we're lucky to be able to submit a paper to the Gordon Bell finals at the supercomputing conference in 2022. What I showed you here in the last slide was a concept that is like A, we use basically one stage, a laser pulse and transfer uh, laser energy to electrons. What we looked in particular in this research here is the very first part, how can we get particles into this accelerating structure? And so what, it, what we needed to model here is not only the plasma that you saw in gray before, but we also need to uh, model a plasma that is super dense and needs way more resolution than the previous simulation. So what we see now in an animation will be that we see a laser pulse bouncing off a dense plasma that needs a lot of resolution and then we use mesh refinement. And then we bounce off electrons, rip them from the surface and then go into a low density plasma to accelerate the particles that we just gained from there. The trick here that we do is to put all the things that we developed in ECP together. We ran on multiple architectures to show scalability on different machines. We use mesh refinement to first use a really large machine to even model the first part and then be faster when we remove the refined part as we go on in the acceleration. And we have load balancing to actually be able to have the particles distributed over the whole machines. Now, the first part that we're interested in is weak scaling. So I sh weak scaling is increasing more and more resolution um, and with computational resources. So for a parting and cell code, you should stay relatively flat on the top here to 100% efficiency. Of course, there are limits and realistic clusters with networking and due to that, we tank a little bit here, but we are generally super high in the order of 80% efficiency over up to five, six orders of magnitude, even on Fugaku of scaling, which is pretty tremendous. The, this is relative performance from going to smaller or older machines to, 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 to bigger machines and exascale, but there's also absolute performance that you can measure, for example, in flops achieved. Um, we have flops achieved in our Gordon Bell paper, um, and they are in the old ballpark that you expect for pick codes, we're roughly in the order of 8 to 15%, depending on the hardware that we use, simply because we are not as flop intense and flop dense as a matrix multiplication. But we can also measure this in the number of our domain signs in terms of how many updates of parties and fields can we do per second. And what you can see here is the benchmarks that we did over the time of EZP from the different machines, from CPUs to rewriting. And in totally, you can see that we got a 500x speed up from both 50x hardware improvement and another 10x of software engineering that we got in here. So the first part we see is this big jump of 5x from rewriting the code and really starting with performance engineering. And then we have further improvements here, like another factor two that we get from optimizing algorithms more and more um, over the life scale, life, lifetime of our project. And then you can redo really a comparison. I have a science case and I want to run on Fugaku and ARM CPUs or on Frontier and GPUs. What will be the more efficient? And it is pretty much as close as the advertised performance number. So it means our performance portability on these different aspects here works. All right, and this is an animation of what happened here. So we have this intermediate part here on the right, which is a solid, solid plasma. And we use the strong scaling of warp X to interact with it by using a high resolution here. Now we move the simulation domain out and we remove the refinement refinement patch dynamically and do a strong scaling. That means using the same computing resources by computing on less data to be faster on the final result. So we combine being large and efficient and then being uh, scaled to more performance. We compared this in Gordon Bell as well to not doing mesh refinement, which of course is way more costly because it's a 3D resolution increase. And we saw the physics is the same, but we can now go with mesh refinement of this first part to way longer simulation lengths. And we did this comparison here in time to solution. And you can see the moment that we remove the patch and use mesh refinement, which are the graphs here, we get this in dramatic increase in simulation time in wall time compared to not doing the simulation uh, with mesh refinement. And the physics comparisons we also did then looked, uh, looked correct. Now, there's, a, there's an interesting question that you could ask now that exascale is basically achieved is 
If we look back in history, are we with exaflops now a thousand times faster than we were with petaflops, right? And the question is, what does faster mean? <laughs> the exact simulation that we did in 2008 would be super small these days. So this simulation would not be a thousand times faster. It might still be faster because we have GPUs with higher clock rates still at some point and we can do more distribution. But usually for the same simulation size that we did in 2008, we had best 20 to 100 times faster. That's weird, right? Because I just showed you that we have actually this full, full speed up. And the reason for that lies we cannot do a small simulation of the past. If we distribute a simulation, we have communication between all these parts here. And the communication itself will at some point dominate if you put smaller and smaller problems on individual computing units like GPUs. This is measured in so-called strong scaling, taking the system size constant and increasing just the computing part of that. And it naturally has to tank at some point because you're just communicating between your computing nodes. Still, nonetheless, you can scale warp X here as we measured here over easily an order of magnitude and a bit more by then just using 50% of efficiency, but you can still get faster if you're willing to take this efficiency hit by taking more communication into account, which is still a great benefit that you can use to run simulations faster than before. So, okay, so if you cannot get the wall time for fixed problem size up, what actually was the reason to do this? The reason for scaling up is the weak scaling and is the increased parallelism. So what we can do now with weak scaling is go to grid resolutions and model particle accelerators that we could not model before. Some of them we could only model in 2D that we can do now in 3D, like the solid reaction that I showed you before. We can address the challenges that I showed you earlier, like modeling more particles, having more effects modeled, or actually increasing high field effects like physics and QD physics actually in the computing envelope to actually get a result out. So the cool thing is you can do more physics now and you can do the result problems that were not able before. This is what you need except for four now. Then. All right. I told you about uh, party accelerators. The application is actually even wider. So why we research specifically to build a collider with these different stages of party accelerators, there are similar applications internationally and locally driving with lasers and with particle beams or looking specifically into quantum electrodynamics physics and discovering um, and probing the fundamental basic blocks of nature of that. This is high energy physics and other applications actually go further, such as fusion energy sciences. In fusion energy sciences, there's a lot of interaction with laser pulses as well that drive the interaction. Yeah, the targets are super dense, like the first example that I showed you from Gordon Bell. And this is another experiment that we just have established at Berkeley Lab that will directly benefit from having these modeling capabilities from originally high energy physics. Now, plasma physics then itself is even broader. And so you can model things like astrophysical phenomena. You can model like the application of particle beams and that you want to use for, for life sciences. You can go to modeling of light sources like the ALS or industry processes like creating radiation. These are things that you can model with such a code. And these are extensions that you can then contribute more and more over the next years and apply the code to, uh, which is really broad and really exciting that we have this code base now on Exascale. Now, just to give you a full overview at the end, I mentioned a lot of parts. This is the full overview on the part here, on the software stack that we developed. We start from MPI and low-level libraries from vendors like CUDA, um, OpenMP as a standard, Circle and HIP. We have the AMREX library uh, built, built on top of that. We use a lot of diagnostics and math libraries. And here on top of that, we start then to implement our own domain-specific libraries. So we develop WarpX, share its routines now over a library that is abstract blast recipes that we then reuse to implement codes like microelectronics modeling, like accelerator lattice design, or specific versions of the particle and cell code. All of this for productivity, then we wrap up together by using a Python layer that we will develop for MREX, which is PyMREX which we then reuse to expose GPU-based um, data structures to the user level. So we can combine in the future these codes together or modules of them and use the unified interface to control them. That's our software stack. Before I go to conclusions and um, some takeaways, any questions at this point? We do have four questions here, but uh, go yes, for the yes. conclusions first. Yeah, let's start maybe with two and then we do the rest of the Q&A, it's not long. Yeah. Well, so would you take the questions now or after the conclusions? Um, so okay, oh, then let's do it after the conclusions then. That's yes. yeah. Yeah. Perfect. So 
with ECP, we had a multiple year strategy um, that allowed us to drive this, this forward to do our domain science focused on our science case and integrate it well. The cool thing that we had really here is the possibility to integrate with vendors and software technologies to rely on each other over multiple release cycles. That's really important, right? We were the first ones that used compilers for our domain that were never used before um, for particle cell modeling. You will see issues there. You will have to iterate with everyone involved. The same for every dependency that you incorporate. We were able to incorporate these dependencies because we could contribute back to them. They were also open source and we could go over release cycles. If you have projects that are only running for a year or two, how often will you introduce a dependency and take the risk that you actually have to fix things in the first start that you're at the point that you start to work with each other? We were able to redesign things. I mentioned that we had on the way to redesign from Fortran to C++ for our core routines. And the multi-year strategy allowed us to do this exploration and then do this one push to do the updates. That's really important for us. We could mitigate risks mid ECP. So ECP had a very focused approach that, for example, you could start new collaborations with other ECP members. And so, for example, we had one part where we had to implement for mesh refinement a new IO strategy because ours was simply not scaling that we anticipated before. And so what we did is we teamed up with the Adios team and we could do a dramatic progress on IO performance um, so that we can actually run at scale and look at our data. The most important part, I think, socially is trust and collaboration. We were able to attract both the national contributors to ECP and international contributors because our funding was not looking at the next science case two years ago, uh, two years in the future. It was going for seven years in a row. So this enabled us to really build this open source community and to also leverage the investment then in spin-up projects in the future so that we could now start like micro microelectronics investigation with a collaborator that spins off from Warbex or start new updates of other codes, which uh, already asks for new funding sources. What really changed to the picture is before and after. If you look at how it looked source codes before, it was basically like this. You have your vendor stack, maybe take MPI, maybe take something that's available on the cluster, implement everything holistically yourself in Fortran, then have some scripts and go forward. With this concept, we can actually rely on dependencies and work as a team on WarpX that is part of a team of teams in ECP. That means we have vendors as teams, we have software technology experts, we have centers, and we can interact with them. We have our own module libraries, and we can actually deploy them in real environments because we have these different teams. This was extremely productive. Um, there are incentives actually in ECP that we found extremely useful, such as we, when we evaluate each other, software technology gets evaluated to really work in applications. So both us and the software technology partners in our dependencies had a really incentive to have a production ready version. And if you have uh, a project that are going on like Exascale, we, we have drive with the vendors to collect bugs and get them fixed um, and prioritized and also implement features and prioritize features with vendors, which is extremely hard to achieve if you're just doing uh, the main science focus uh, approach. The way forward, how we, how we already started and how we go now forward with, with funding such as SciTech, which is smaller, um, but is um, really helping us to continue in our community, is to standardize. There's a cost to be first at extra scale, but now the way forward is to deduplicate as, as, as much as possible in the community, use our inputs um, and outputs formats as the common glue to describe codes, and to take the leadership role that we had right now to push really collaboration on sustainable development by using standards for coding, for data, and things that we don't need to reinvent uh, again. We currently lead a collaboration here, um, and this attracts also US and international collaborators that adopt our data standards, give us feedback, and also contribute um, to parts of developments so that we can, as a community, really focus on standards and then implement the code around that. Now, in conclusion, ECP enabled us to rewrite an efficient code and abstracting it to run on multiple architectures instead of porting it. We had an extremely successful collaboration with AMRX. Um, that we have that we have experienced here, and the great outcome at the end was that we got a 500x real time FOM increase. So figure of merit, which I meant to with updates of parties and 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 measures um, over time compared to pre ECP, and we won the Golden Bell Prize in 22, which we are extremely happy and grateful about. We could really sustain the sustain sustainable development over nearly a decade. What I mentioned just a minute before, and our teams. Could be super diverse. We had a computational physicists, applied mathematicians for algorithms, 
computer science and software engineering really to contribute onto this common goal. And I mentioned before, management was extremely, uh, extremely efficient, extremely helpful as well in this whole structures to steer um, efficiently and address changes as they arise. With that, I'm looking forward to your questions and I'm finished with the slides. Thank you, Max. Very nice. So we have, I think, five or six questions here. We may go over the hour. So let's see here. How uh, First, how do you pay for ongoing computing power, power needed just for the download install CI tests? That's a good point. The two, two things that we can do. Um, so the CI tests, since we work in the open, the, uh, as everyone on GitHub and other projects, we are supported by companies that maintain the uh, CI tests. So we have like GitHub specifically gives you three resources for CI. Um, I did the math at some point. It's the CI resources are not comparable to a typical allocation that I have for computing. So they are significantly smaller. Um, so that's that's totally uh, still in a, a legit, um, legit envelope. There is though, they, I don't know, nonetheless, I think CI is extremely critical to our development workflows. So the I'm very, very happy that um, centers like NERSC and OCF now provide resources so that we can integrate some of the CI work. And currently it's after merging, unfortunately, it's not before merging, but some of the CI work that we can do, we can integrate with them and have basically not only the hardware that we're actually targeting, but we also have the, uh, it's basically also available in case Microsoft stops sponsoring GitHub Actions. Yeah. So the next question here, what is your approach to performance testing? We cannot run performance tests on supercomputers the yeah. way we do CI. How often do you perform? How often do you do performance tests of your code? Yeah. So we, we do this at multiple levels. Um, we have a couple of tests that we run once a week. Uh, because we have the summit, uh, summit allocation um, that we run once a week on Summit and Cori at some time. Um, we do a specific test case that we have for EZP that's very, that's very general for our case. We do this every few months um, as well. And that's like full scale. So we don't do full scale testing every week, right? But we, um, that one is really the end, the, the number of truth that it was this table that I showed you. Um, one thing that we started to integrate is doing small tests just on a single node to see that you don't have and uh, regressions in kernels. That one is still, a, so we just automated this for, for one of our projects and we will take this over for other projects as well. So that will be extremely useful to see like, okay, does the register pressure suddenly make, uh, increase from this code change suddenly make this kernel extremely slow or does the software version have a regression? So yeah, these are a couple of things um, that we do. So yeah, multi-level, most uh, and ideally most of them are automated. Um, for specific hardware, try to narrow your test cases down to something that makes already sense on a single node. All right, I think this is more into the physics. You said that plasma-driven particle accelerators can work on the millimeter scale. What kind of electric field gradient can it achieve in the particle in-cell model? How yeah. big is a cell in this case? Will exascale computers be needed? Yeah, so that's that's super cool. And the, uh, the the challenge, so with conventional particle accelerators, you create big cavities, they're usually metal cavities, and then you put a big potential on them. So basically, uh, yeah, volts. And the problem is that if you put too many volts on such a cavity, it will break down. So you can go up to a couple of hundred megavolts per meter, and then you start to pull off electrons from the surface of this cavity. With plasma accelerators, we are four orders of magnitude higher in fields that we can generate. And that means, Theoretically, we could be four orders of magnitude smaller. Um, in practice, what since this is so small, we have to control the plasma, and that's where all our research is going into. So, how can we create a, a scalable uh, accelerator? So now, now the question to computing: um, Do we still need large computing? Yes, you need because the resolution then is not going on like in a public accelerator where you would go for micrometer scale resolution, but we have to go down to. Uh, um, like eight seconds sometimes to to uh, of resolution in time and equivalent time scales of sub sub micro yeah but this is actually micro up to nanometers actually a few nanometers of resolution in time is in cell so if you put this into a three D simulation you have like simulation boxes tens of thousands of cells cubed and um, they need an exascale computer to fit even in memory yeah. Next, um, your Gordon Bell Prize included Fugaku. Uh -huh. uh, how did you get support to port optimize on that? Yeah, so the Fugaku contribution is from our international contributors. ECP did not target AMD, uh, ARM, 
CPU architectures. And this is our contribution from our French and Japanese contributors that are co-authors on this paper that did the tuning for Fugaku. We had access though, and we of course supported them. We had a test machine on Stony Brook um, that we used on our side in the US also to fix bugs, to do tuning and to report like compiler bugs and, and get the ball rolling. But the nitty gritty tuning of, for Fugaku was the uh, international contribution that we had. Next, after going through this process uh, of building Warbex, uh, um, uh, there, uh, are there features, abilities of other performance portability layers like Cocos, which we're now thinking uh, could be missing in uh, AMRX? That's a great question. Cr Christian Trott, are you asking this question? Uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> Christian is the Cocos developer, uh, the lead. Um, it's an the, anonymous uh, here, anonymous. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, okay, someone just exposed them to me in the in the chat. The um AMX is uh, the it, they these uh, most of the performance portability layers and they are great papers actually comparing Cocos and Zico. They start to converge to a certain extent, which is exactly how it should be because we meet at conferences and we find what works and doesn't over the last ten years of developing these portability layers. There are still a couple of significant differences. So like Circle and Cocos feels a little bit like a proper C++ abstracted version of OpenMP by other port performance portability layers like Alpaca, for example, that developed in Europe at the time. It's more like a generalized version of CUDA. Um, AMREX is closer already to standard C++, which also Cocos is driving significantly going forward. The one feature that I that I would personally that I personally miss um, that I would like to have in AMREX is the uh, hierarchical parallelism that Cocos has. Um, and I, I need this like in a very few parts. Um, the, so what you can basically do is you can yeah, stack your parallel force into each other and, and partial reductions. Um, we, we are able still to express this. It's just a little bit more verbose in MREX um, for this, this part, but this is the only thing that I, um, that I find like curious and wanna, wanna write more intricate algorithms with. Um, that doesn't mean though that we cannot implement Cocos in MREX. Um, or that we can use MX as a backend going forward. So this will just depending on, is it worth the, uh, the integration and the dependency? Um, and then, yeah, we might actually use this in the go going forward. Yeah. Uh, the two last, last questions here. The, fir the first, is Fortran 90 the current standard and is it still fast? Is C++ better for some part of the code like garbage collection and memory? The, um, that's, that's a bit hard to answer. The uh, so garbage, collect, garbage collection themselves we do explicit as well in C++, um, but we have modern like containers that help us with that when we deallocate them to not leak memory. The performance uh, implementation, see, so it's, it's, it's shown and I'm very biased here because I'm a long-term C++ meta programming person, but the, it's shown that performance of C++ is the same as Fortran these days if you program it directly. Um, you need to do a couple of annotations. So you have to express to a compiler, for example, that when you hit, run around with pointers, that these pointers are not aliasing themselves, but there are co commands and extensions for that that you just use for that. So the performance can be the same. The difference is why we use C++ is, is because it allows us to uh, um, do this performance abstraction in a way that is extremely focused and extremely portable. So the maintainability aspect of our code and the amount of compilers that we can use because industry targets C++ compilers first and the amount of backends and alternatives that we can use to run on a single machine, that is what is really important for us. And that's why C++ is our choice. So there's just way more going on. There's more momentum and we want to contribute to this momentum. There's a lot of standardization going on in C++. It's moving dramatically in the accelerator space, so the <laughs> GPU space and the uh, FPGA space, this is what we want to benefit from and we want it on day zero. That's why we choose C++. Then the last question here, um, what is the criterion for AMR? The, oh, that's a good point. Currently our AMR implementation is, um, so currently our implementation is a mesh refinement implementation. So we, uh, we pick currently still where we want to solve based on our physics informed uh, logic. We have in WAP, we had AMR implementations that pick this automatically, but it's tricky. It's really tricky for, for beams because we have long range potentials. Um, so what we're exploring with is, is, is algorithms like maybe doing a predictor corrector 
or picking um, heuristics such as going where there are steep density gradients. We want to have more mesh refinement automatically, but this is an active research topic. So currently we do mesh refinement. We have on the technical side, the adaptive mesh refinement capabilities, but for the physics currently, we rather still put it ourselves manually where we want the refinement patches. All right, and that's it. Thank you very much again, Axel. Thank you all the participants, uh, particularly those who stayed with us until now. Uh, um, um,